that is now open God's word. The Genesis 39. And we'll read the whole chapter and that's also the text for the sermon this morning. Genesis 39. There we read the word of God. Now Joseph had, him, had been brought down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had brought him from the Ishmaelites, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favour in his sight and attended him and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused. And said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house. And he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am. Nor has he kept back anything from me, except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this wickedness? And sin against God. And as he spoke to jo as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her, or to be with her. But one day, when he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house were there in the house, she caught him by his garment, saying, "Lie with me." But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came in to me to lie with me. And I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. Then she laid up his garment by her until his master came home. And she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came in to me to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me, his anger was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison the place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favour in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, 
He was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. Thus far scripture reading. Let us sing after the sermon as response from Psalm 66, verses 7 and 8. 66, 7 and 8. <coughs> Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Twice in succession, Joseph is deeply humiliated and sees his hopes shattered. Both times, his robe or garment is taken from him and used as evidence against him. The first time, his richly ornamented robe, which his brothers dipped in blood, had to prove that he was killed by animals. The second time, his robe was used as proof that he wanted to seduce Potiphar's wife. In both cases, his robe was used to cover up a lie. Joseph suffers great injustice and sees his life falling apart, so to speak. He is sold as a slave and later on even thrown in prison. But beloved, how does Joseph react to these things? Is Joseph a defeated man? Is he completely broken? Does he become cynical, angry and bitter? Now this future seems to have been destroyed. Yes, is it so that his life has been destroyed? And that there's no hope for him? Well, let's look at that. When I preach to you, the Lord is with Joseph. Firstly, in Potiphar's house. Secondly, in the hour of temptation. And thirdly, in prison. So the Lord is with Joseph in Potiphar's house, in the hour of temptation, and in prison. Well, there you have Joseph. In Egypt, a slave to Potiphar. Without any rights, merely a slave, someone else's property. With no hope of ever being released. What a sad situation to be in. Would Joseph have understood the purpose of it all? In such a situation, one usually struggles with questions like, why does the Lord do this? How can the Lord let this happen to me? But there's no immediate answer. This is usually the case in such situations. When my life goes through a dark patch, I hardly ever immediately understand why it's happening. My questions are usually then left unanswered. My future just looks bleak. You could hardly imagine that the situation could be worse than that of Joseph in Egypt. However, beloved, if you as a child of God go through deep waters, through difficult times, this doesn't mean that God has abandoned you. Maybe it looks like that. Maybe you think it's the case. But it's not true. The Lord goes with us through the depths like a shepherd, he leads us through the valley of the shadow of death. The 
history of Joseph makes this very clear to us. While Joseph is a slave to Potiphar, we read, And the Lord was with Joseph. Did you hear it? The Lord was with Joseph. It is possible. You may be in the most horrible situation while God is still with you. Your whole life may, so to speak, fall apart. Your hope be shattered. But the Lord is there with you. It is possible. You can lead a most miserable existence. Yet it does not mean that the Lord has abandoned you. Look at Joseph. He no longer has any rights. He's just a slave. He belongs to someone else. Yet in that miserable situation, the Lord is with him. That's the secret of his life. It's also what determines whether your life is successful or not. Whether it's worthwhile or not. Humanly speaking, Joseph's life, life is a failure. What a hopeless situation. But we read that Joseph was successful. Well, would you call that success? In our society, success is often measured according to what you possess. If you have a thriving business, if you have a good social standing with high income, you're considered to be successful. Your success is measured to what you own. How then can we say that Joseph was successful in, jo in Potiphar's house? Joseph has absolutely nothing of his own. He's just a slave without a cent to his name. Everything he does and obtains is for his master. And Potiphar clearly benefits from Joseph's services. The blessing of the Lord that is upon Joseph flows to Potiphar. This makes Potiphar prosperous. Thus one can say that Joseph himself does not benefit from all his hard work, except that he does gain Potiphar's favour. All the material gain goes to his master. And what Joseph longs for most, his freedom, he doesn't receive. Can you then call him successful? Surely the blessing of the Lord should benefit the person who is blessed. The Lord is with Joseph and blesses him. But Potiphar reaps the rewards, and not Joseph himself. Brothers and sisters, this history shows that success is not a matter of mere material or physical well-being. Despite Joseph being a slave, his life is a success. God makes his life fruitful. A blessing to others. Success is to be of service to God and to your neighbour. Joseph's life is a life of service. The Lord is with him. This is the secret of his life. It makes his life a success. Even though it may look like a failure in people's eyes. And that success becomes evident. Potiphar notices it. 
Joseph prospers in all that Potiphar gets him to do. But that's not all that Potiphar notices. He also sees that the Lord is with him. And that the Lord causes all that he does to succeed. Verse 3. A striking remark. How can Potiphar notice that the Lord is with Joseph? In Egypt, the Lord is an unknown God. Potiphar can only know this through Joseph himself. Joseph must have spoken freely to him about the Lord. Joseph is not ashamed to speak of his Lord God. He speaks of him and lets himself be led by him in all that he does. And thus Potiphar could see that it is more than just a natural ability on the part of Joseph. It's the Lord, his God, blessing him. Joseph is a readable letter of his Lord. Yes, here you see, brothers and sisters, how important it is to be a readable letter of God. Can your employer, can you, your employees, your colleagues recognize God in your attitude and behavior? Do you make God visible in your life? Yes, we can sometimes, through our conduct, block the view to God. And then no one gets to know God through us. Well, with Joseph, this is different. Through him, Potiphar sees the Lord at work. Joseph does not draw the attention to himself and away from God. On the contrary, he draws attention away from himself to God. Can you imagine this? In that situation Joseph's in, after all he has experienced, even though he does not understand God's ways, yet he stands up for the Lord, his God. He confesses his faith in him. In that humiliating situation of serving as a slave in Egypt, Joseph magnifies the Lord. He does not reason, well, the Lord has forsaken me. He lets this terrible thing happen to me. What's the use of still serving him? No, Joseph remains faithful to God. He reflects the glory of his God in everything he does. He draws the attention of people to the Lord, his God. And that's still our calling today. I must also be a, reading le a readable letter of God. Let your light so shine before men, Christ says, that they may see your good works. And give glory to who? Give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Matthew 5 verse 16. When everything goes smoothly in your life, then you might not find it difficult to do this. But remember, Joseph is a readable letter of God. While his life seems to be a failure, and he seems to have no hope. In good days and bad, we must be God's letters of recommendation. 
But brothers and sisters, it is questionable whether it's easier to be readable letters of Christ in good days. In everything in life, if everything in life runs smoothly and we seem successful, then it's so easy to draw the attention to yourself, is it not? Look what I have done. Look what I have achieved. But when all things that I trust in fall apart, and I'm left with empty hands. Then there's little room to boast in myself. Then there's more room to make God visible in my life. And in order to make God visible, I must first of all give up all my pride and acknowledge my total dependence on God. Joseph is humiliated, but God makes him great. God is with him. That's his strength. He entrusts himself to God, whatever the circumstances, and God blesses him. Thus, part of his attention is drawn to this young man, and he gives him more and more responsibilities. Joseph becomes a blessing to Potiphar's house. We read in verse 5, The Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for, fair, for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. Joseph is in charge of everything. A great responsibility he receives towards God. And man, yes, also towards God. For if Joseph does not live up to what, fair, what Potiphar expects, then the name of the Lord, his God, will be hurt. But then comes the hour of temptation, the second point. Joseph is put to the test. Will he remain true to his master and to his God? Potiphar's wife takes special interest in Joseph, a handsome young man. What a temptation. Joseph is and remains a slave in a foreign country, far from home, without companionship, alone. Would you not in such a situation long for companionship, for love in a hard world? Joseph is not a man without desires or sexual feelings. He's a man of flesh and blood, just like every one of us. And that makes the situation so dangerous. Joseph is resolute in his refusal to lie with Potiphar's wife. And notice how he reasons with her. He does not respond to her proposal with words such as, I do not feel for you, or I do not feel like it. No, Joseph says, it would be sin. I would betray your master's trust. How can I do this wickedness and sin against God? Notice how correctly Joseph assesses the situation. He realizes that his personal feelings and desires are not relevant here. And my feelings should never be the norm for my behavior. A certain act does not become good when it satisfies my personal feelings. My responsibility to God and man 
is what determines whether something is good or bad. The sexual experience is not a goal in itself. It may not be, be determined solely by feelings, desires. It needs to be regulated by God's will, his word. Well, beloved, how wonderful that Joseph remains true to God and to Potiphar. According to the spirit of our time, people today easily start rationalising such a sexual relationship. They whitewash it, justify it by arguing, for example, Joseph is, after all, young and healthy, and it's only natural that he wants to fulfil his sexual desires. A little love in his lonely position can only do him good. In any case, one cannot blame him for it, for she invited him to do it. And if the woman wants it, why would you refuse? It would seem that she does not receive enough love and tension in her own marriage and also needs a little extra love. Besides, no one will notice because she will certainly not speak about it. Then why not enjoy it while you can? Do you recognise this type of reasoning? This is how extramarital relationships are often entered into and justified today. What a huge temptation for our young people, but also for those who are married and feel their marriage is not very fulfilling. Thankfully, Joseph doesn't give in to such sinful ideas. He remains resolute in his refusal. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God. However, Potiphar's wife doesn't just give up. Day after day, she tries to persuade him to lie with her. Saying no for the first time may not be so difficult. But having to say no day after day is far more difficult. You can start entertaining the idea in your mind. You can start paying more attention to such a woman. You can start feeling flattered by her interest and attention, especially when you feel rejected and lonely. Your resistance weakens and the desire grows. So you can then come dangerously close to the point of giving in. Joseph is likely not completely free of this. This may be evident from his reaction at the critical moment during the hour of temptation. Such moments are there when all things come together in such a way as to lure you into falling. Satan is ready to overwhelm you. One day they're alone in the house. Part of his wife seizes the opportunity. She takes him by his garment and says, Come, this is our chance. There's no one else in the house who can detect us. Come lie with me. It all gets too much for Joseph. He can no longer reason with her. The only thing he can do is flee from the situation. 
That's the only thing he can do to withstand the temptation. It's not such a noble solution. Running away is not very honourable. Especially not to run away without your garment. But in that situation, it's the only way to stay true to God and to Potiphar. Brothers and sisters, how could Joseph resist that temptation? Not because he, by nature, was such a strong man. Not because he had no longing for a woman. His flight would seem to show that this is not the case. He remained faithful. Why? Because he feared God. God was with him. God gave him strength. God gave him the victory. And victory is promised to every one of us when we truly seek him and his strength. Fair Joseph's allegiance to Fair Potiphar and to God brings him in prison. With a lie, Potiphar's wife manages to get him locked up. Joseph is once again suffering great injustice. He must now suffer because of his loyalty to God. Yes, it seems as though he's being punished for his faithfulness to his God. As a slave, Joseph can do nothing but accept his injustice. Joseph has no rights whatsoever and no court of appeal. His situation seems worse than ever. How can he ever get out of prison? There is no one outside the prison to defend his cause. There's little reason for hope. He can only expect isolation and loneliness. The only one from whom he can expect something is the Lord his God. But would, have, would it have been clear to him at that point of time what he could expect from the Lord? Yes, what can one expect from the Lord in such a situation? While suffering such injustice? Can you expect the Lord to free you in the near future? Well, God did not give such a promise to us. God is not the great ombudsman who is there to immediately solve all your problems for you. Nowhere has God promised us that he will avert all evil and keep us out of trouble. What he has promised is that he will be with us in all circumstances and that he will let everything work together for the good of those who love him. That's what he promised. Beloved, despite the injustice of his imprisonment, Joseph doesn't get caught up in self-pity or despondency. He stands up, tries to be positive and helpful, and thus he wins the favour of the prison keeper. And as a result, the prison officer gives him more and more responsibilities. Yes, in such a situation, it would have been so easy to become bitter and angry. For the second time, Joseph sees his life fall apart, so to speak. What a terrible injustice. And not, be able, not being able to do anything about it. 
many people struggle with injustice in their lives. How difficult is it not to accept this? You can keep getting worked up about it and remain angry. It can become an obsession to you. But in this way, you're in fact constantly busy with yourself. You feel sorry for yourself. But this gets, gets you no further. It doesn't build up. It makes matters worse. Beloved, despite all the injustice he suffers, Joseph does not become cynical, bitter, angry. How can that be? Well, it's only possible if you entrust yourself to the Lord. I can only do this when I see God behind everything that happens to me. When I accept that God is ultimately in control, despite the injustice people do to me, this knowledge of faith protects me from becoming bitter, negative, angry. Then the most important thing is not what people do to me. But the most important thing is what God wishes to do with me. God's purposes. Then I might know for sure it's never God's intention to hinder me in my relationship and service to him. It's never his intention to make me bitter. Never. But it's always his intention to draw me closer to himself and to make something beautiful out of me. No, you don't always immediately see it this way. That God is in control and that even the injustice done to me works together for my good is something I can't immediately pinpoint. It's a matter of faith. And faith is ultimately a conviction of the things that I do not yet see. Hebrews 11 verse 1. Faith prevents you from becoming cynical and bitter. God remains in control. When I believe that, then I can be positive and helpful. Also when I suffer wrong and it looks as though my hopes are shattered. Faith builds bridges for Joseph. It brings light in the dark cell God is with him. God shows his steadfast love to him and grants him favour in the eyes of the prison officer. Well, usually there is a huge, solid wall between the prison officer and the prisoners. The prison officers were free to do what they like with the prisoners. There was no Amnesty International to keep an eye on them. There was no one who cared about the lot of the prisoners. Yet here we see that in Egypt the great divide is bridged. A good relationship grows between the jailer and the Hebrew slave, Joseph. God is preparing the way for Joseph's future. No doubt everything neatly falls into place according to God's plan. Joseph is not thrown into an ordinary prison. 
Now he's put into the prison where the king's prisoners are confined. And in this way, Joseph will eventually come to the attention of the king. God is preparing Joseph for his future position of leadership. God is shaping him through thick and thin into a man God wants him to be. A blessing to Egypt and a blessing to Jacob's house. Well, brothers and sisters, would you still doubt that God is in control? What an awesome and faithful God we have. One who is always actively present for the salvation.